Did COVID-19 emerge from a laboratory in China as a result of research that was funded by U.S. taxpayers? Well, the Senate Homeland Security Committee held a hearing this week to consider this very question. Now, the committee heard from four scientific experts on what the current information suggests about the possibility of the lab leak origins of COVID versus natural origins, the idea that perhaps COVID arose in nature and spread from diseased animals to people possibly in a wet market. Meanwhile, Dr. Anthony Fauci went on MSNBC and said that he's frustrated people still blame him, can't appreciate how the scientific understanding of COVID evolved during the pandemic. Let's watch that. How frustrating is it to you that people look back with 2020 hindsight and judge you uh, when you and the rest of the world was in the fog of war? You know, it is quite frustrating, Joe, and that relates exactly to the answer to the question just a moment ago where I was saying that people really don't appreciate I don't blame them for that, but they don't appreciate that we were dealing with a moving target. Not enough appreciation. Well, here to discuss it all is Republican Senator Rand Paul, who joins us. Thanks so much for coming on Rising. Thanks for having me. So what did you make of the hearing the other day where uh, I had a colleague of mine from Reason Magazine there saying it was a really um, impressive uh, debate, you know, getting very uh, deep dive on the scientific subject for the evidence for and against uh, lab leak theory versus the natural origin theory? Yeah, and if you listen closely, though, there's not a whole lot of evidence on the side of saying it came from animals. The only real evidence is that historically we know that this has taken place. We know that the coronavirus from 2002, 2003, from that epidemic, uh, they found an animal reservoir, civet cats, and they found that the people who handled the cats had increased antibodies to this. They found a restaurant where this was being delivered. There was a lot of evidence. Also MERS, M-E-R-S, which was another coronavirus, they found an intermediate animal host in uh, camels. So then we get fast forward to 2020, and as COVID-19 comes out, they look for an animal reservoir and they've been looking for three years. They tested uh, you know, 90,000 some odd animals, but we found no animal positive for this, no animal reservoir. So that's the strongest evidence against this. The other evidence that uh, Dr. Quay and Dr. Ebright presented was that when you look at the genetic structure of this virus, it's very unusual. It has what's called a furin cleavage site, which allows the virus to get into the cells And this particular sequence of RNA doesn't exist in any other coronaviruses in this family. In fact, Dr. Quay has said that this family of viruses has been stable for about a thousand years. You can apparently uh, have a evolutionarily or a molecular clock to look at how long a family of viruses have been stable. And there hasn't been a virus in this family with the furin cleavage site. We also know that the uh, Wuhan lab in question was inserting furin cleavage sites where they have published papers that they were doing this. We know they had discussed in 2018 a large project in conjunction with the University of North Carolina to do exactly this. So there's a lot of circumstantial evidence on one side and there's basically no evidence on the other side other than that we know that uh, animal viruses do occasionally infect humans. But the other argument against this coming from animals is that When animal viruses infect humans, they do so poorly initially, and they often will evolve over time to become more infective. So SARS-1 never really transmitted well from human to human. And so quarantine measurements and telling measurements uh, and measures and telling people to stay home actually did help to control the spread of SARS-1, but didn't work very well with COVID-19 because COVID-19 showed up, as Dr. Alina Chan has mentioned, pre-adapted for transmission, already red hot and ready to go human to human, which looks more like what you'd see if a virus had been passed through animals in the lab to become sort of push natural selection towards human transmission. And that's what many of the scientists believe now. But I think the evidence was overwhelming in favor of the lab. And I didn't hear any evidence from uh, the Democrat witnesses that uh, really was very persuasive at all saying it came from animals. And then one other uh, point from the hearing was that Dr. Gary, the expert um, giving his uh, opinion that it was more likely to come from natural origin, was also the co-author of the Nature uh, paper uh, that early on in the pandemic really solidified the idea in, in so many people's minds that it, that it was natural origin, that it, they said it was 
um, I, virtually impossible for it to have come from a lab. We, you know, we now know that that was somewhat motivated at conference calls and met- messages coordinated by Dr. Fauci himself. Um, that figure, Dr. Gary, was questioned about uh, funding he subsequently received from NIH, from the, from the federal government, um, and, and he did not, uh, to my knowledge, I, if I, my recollection, he didn't deny, did not deny receiving that funding. I, I think he said he, he may have, he you know, didn't, didn't quite remember. Um, what did you make of that line of questioning? You know, in my book, Deception, The Great COVID Cover-Up, I go into great detail the hypocrisy of people like Bob Gary. He, Christian Anderson, and several other scientists were meeting with Fauci at the very beginning, February 1st of 2020, and every one of them were saying in private, my goodness, this is not a conspiracy. This looks like this virus was manipulated. Looks like it was manipulated in the lab. It looks like this could have been a lab leak. That's what they're all saying privately. Anthony Fauci gets them together, and within about a day or so, they're already writing a paper, and in that paper, it concludes that this virus is not a construct of a lab. And so when I ask uh, Dr. Ebright, who's a 30-year professor at Rutgers, has written many papers with younger scientists, whether he would accept a scientific paper as being part of the scientific method to say something so categorical and so uh, uh, adamant that this virus is not a laboratory construct, would he accept that? And he said, no, that's not part of the scientific method. That's more of a political statement. And I think that's really what we had from the beginning is not science, but scientists who were making political statements because they didn't want any uh, argument to link research to the pandemic because they were afraid of the overall influence that might have on government dollars funding more research in this area. Now, a lot of members of Congress were critical of Fauci's policies around containing the virus initially. Of course, public health policy is messy, especially at the beginning of a pandemic. But it seems that there there should be, and I'm curious if there is, a growing amount of, of senators, your colleagues, that are critical of Anthony Fauci surrounding his funding when he was at the NIAID and was allocating you know, funding to labs that are based in the U.S. but are partnered with labs overseas, specifically the, the Wuhan Virology Lab, where they were doing this kind of research that led to people assuming a lab leak theory could be more connected to Anthony Fauci than we previously knew. With all this information coming out, are people critical that Anthony Fauci had some role in intentionally quelling this idea of a lab leak coming out? Are your colleagues increasingly critical because of this? You know, the House COVID committee looked at this and they asked Anthony Fauci directly and Francis Collins, the former director of the NIH, directly whether or not there were internal controls to tell whether a foreign lab was safe enough to do this kind of research. And they both acted as if they had no idea whether the Wuhan lab had enough safety controls. This is part of the reason, another argument, another circumstantial argument why people think that it it leaked from the lab because there's four different levels of safety in a lab. So a BSL-2 lab is a two, all the way up to a four. Most people think the most dangerous things need to have ventilators and ventilator masks and all this stuff to prevent the researchers from getting sick. A two, you don't even have to necessarily wear a mask. Sometimes you wear a mask, but that's it. You don't have the proper ventilation, negative ventilation, uh, taking everything away from you. And so many people think that there wasn't enough safety and that Fauci and Collins really seem to know nothing about uh, safety. There's also this idea of secondary grants. Initially, Fauci argued, oh, he didn't fund the research because he funded EcoHealth, who then they funded the research. So there's a lot of secondary grants going on that I don't think are getting the proper screen. We've discovered in our investigation that UC Davis, UC Berkeley, and a few other places were subcontracting to actually the uh, Academy of Military Medical Research in China, which is populated mostly by Chinese soldiers. Uh, People have dual, they may well be scientists, but they have dual appointments in uh, uh, biological research for their military. And really we shouldn't be funding that kind of stuff. And it seems like nobody had a good idea on this. So I think people are more and more concluding, yes, that this was a a great judgment error by Anthony Fauci and not knowing whether there was safety, but it's also this bigger debate 
Really going all the way back to about 2005, Dr. Ebright, one of our witnesses, said that the debate began when someone created the Spanish flu in a lab. And once they did, people were like, oh my goodness, they've pre-created a virus that we haven't been able to find on the planet for 100 years that killed 100 million people, and people became alarmed. And then in 2010, they took the avian flu. This is the one when they kill all the chickens, and right now it's in our cows. People are very worried because it has a very high death rate in humans, but fortunately, like most animal viruses, is not very transmissible to humans. But they had a, a researcher in the Netherlands in 2010 said, hey, why don't we mutate avian flu and see if we can infect humans easier? And they did. They made it spread through the air, which it normally doesn't do, and then they made it more transmissible among mammals. This is sort of like a death wish for civilization. But at this time, there became some uh, drawn lines in the scientific community. Anthony Fauci said that gain-of-function research was valuable. Even if a pandemic should occur, it's worth the risk. Well, I think after 15 million people dying from a virus that in all likelihood came from a lab, uh, I don't think it is worth the risk. And I think that it's taxpayer money. We should be looking at the dangers of this research. And I don't think recreating smallpox is a good idea. I don't think creating Ebola and making it more aerosolized is a good idea or avian flu. Um, so these are things that really should be discussed. And this was the first bipartisan hearing and hopefully it's going to eventually uh, bring Democrats to get more interested in this. But you'll notice only two of them showed up on the committee. Mm. So only two Democrats out of maybe 10 or 11 Democrats showed up for the committee or asked questions. One more uh, question before we let you go. Uh, you you might have seen uh, early this week, I think it was over the weekend, end of last week, bombshell report from Reuters about the U.S. military having had a disinformation campaign to actually promote vaccine hesitancy among Filipinos and uh, Asian Muslims to turn them against the Chinese government that just got revealed that, you know, we were, our administration, our own government was doing this at the same time, you know, the, President Biden, highest levels of, of the government saying social media companies are killing people because they allow too many contrarian opinions about vaccines and about COVID in general. Um, have you heard this story? What do you make of it? And I, I think so many of us were shocked by the sheer amount of hypocrisy and the kind of moral evil to, you know, convince, be, being convinced Filipino people and other people who were at risk, elderly, at, of, of a serious COVID outcome, that they should distrust uh, the, the Chinese vaccine. Um, it, it's amazing. What is your reaction? It doesn't surprise me. I mean, when people say, oh, well, there's misinformation out and we need the government to police misinformation, I remind people that government is the biggest purveyor of misinformation probably ever known in the history of mankind. So the fact that they're promoting a vaccine here and promoting, uh, you know, uh, you know, concern or uh, lack of uh, value for the vaccine overseas, who knows? It could be even more nefarious. Were they trying to promote our vaccine at the, as opposed to another vaccine? you know, was it a monetary reward? Mm. See, we now have NIH got $450 million from Moderna sharing the patent. And people say, well, that's fair. The government scientists worked on this. The problem is, is now, do you think NIH can objectively judge Moderna if they get a $450 million check mm. from one company? How do you objectively, uh, you know, look at any kind of Moderna projects? So there's a lot of things going on. And the, the biggest thing about knowing that government might be dishonest with you is that uh, medical freedom needs to be individualized. Uh, government can have a role in uh, giving advice on public health, you know, trying to give you uh, accurate death rates, trying to tell what happens if you've been infected, are you protected? If you've been vaccinated, are you protected? But ultimately the individual needs to sift through this because what we've learned is the government isn't always honest with us and the government may have another agenda. And believe it or not, I think the government sometimes may have the agenda of enriching private corporations and not really an agenda that's health, health related. Hmm. So Senator it sounds Paul, like, yeah, amazing. Yeah, you, really quick ahead. before we go, the committee's had about 28 hearings over the last 15 months. Has attendance among the Democrats on the committee been consistent or was this something different, two out of the 11? We haven't had many hearings on our side. Most of those hearings have been on the House side. Right. And the House uh, has had some Democrat involvement. It's hard for me to comment because I haven't been present in those hearings. 
In our hearings, I had a subcommittee hearing about a year and a half ago. I've been pressing for a full committee hearing for probably two years, and I finally got the full committee hearing. When I did my subcommittee hearing, zero Democrats showed up. Even the other the other member of the committee didn't show up. The, the, the chairman of the subcommittee didn't show up. In this, two people did show up. But the real debate now is not whether it could have come from the lab. I think everybody's acknowledging at least the possibility that the virus came from the lab. But now it's if you don't think it, there's much danger that it came from the lab and it probably came from animals, they're content that the Biden administration has put forward regulations that'll fix this. And then those of us who really think it came from the lab think that's not enough. And then we also found out from testimony from Dr. Quay that three scientists from MIT, despite these regulations, were able to order the fragments of the Spanish flu and put it together despite the regulations from the White House. So I think all points towards needing legislation, and that's a big debate we'll have now. Can Biden administration or presidents and the executive branch and NIH fix it and police themselves, or do they need oversight from the legislature? And I think without question, we need to pass a bill and we need an independent commission to be looking at this research. Yeah, you know, people are saying, or the other side is saying, let's also talk about uh, regulation or what policies could make the handling of animals safer. That you know, That's fine by me. I certainly want to you know, close off any possibility of a future virus a arising from, from either condition. But what baffles me is some of the people who say, well, we, we'll never know and it, it doesn't matter. I'm like, are you not curious? I think it, it has tremendous stakes and is, is one of the most important like questions in human history given the the scale of the death from the last pandemic senator paul thank yeah, you so much for joining us today we really appreciate thank it thank you